I really like to think that it was a really idyllic setting for, for my ancestors to, to be in. They did live very much in tune with nature. They took what nature gave and lived by the water in the, in the summer, and they moved further inland in the winter. And they also as well had a very structured form of, of government. And you know they, they had a, a structure of government that that worked very well for them. There were a lot of negative experiences um, with with Europeans prior to the arrival of the Mayflower in, in 1620. So there, there would have been a lot of skepticism when they, they saw the Mayflower on the horizon, especially because it would have been the Gnostics that, that were watching that Mayflower as it docked in Provincetown Harbor. And so for them, they would have been watching it very carefully to wonder if they were there to capture more of their young men to take them as slaves, or were they there in good faith to trade? Our police have been talking and they say that the ship is like no other to come here before. They haven't cast any nets, shown no kettles, coats, or any sign of our missing men. They didn't come here to fish or trade. They didn't come here like the thieves and stole out men. These are armed men and they bring their women and children. But probably would have been most shocking would have been the first washing. So that was the first washing was the first point when women and children stepped off of the boat. Now, I am very confident in saying that my ancestors would have been watching that very carefully. And they would have seen women and children for the first time step off of the boat and start washing their clothes. They've never seen, you know, in the you know decades prior to that, ever saw a woman or a child that was European. And so that was the first time and they, they would have been watching very carefully, trying to figure out what was going on. At last, my feet are on solid ground, but I can still feel myself rolling as was the steady motion of the ship these last two months. I just give thanks to our Lord God that we are no longer aboard that ship. And I think that's probably why there was a gap between that first washing and what was later dubbed first encounter where they they decided that it was time to to drive them off the shores they may not be the same as those who have stolen our men or brought sickness but why do chase us through the forest banging on their chest like a pack of turtles should we fear them or laugh at them there is no sign of our men amongst them and there's no sign they'll make good neighbors. I say we drive them out. I've observed enough. They're camped at Palmet. Gather the rest of the men with the bows and arrows. Tonight we will do a ceremony and strike at sunrise. Obviously, the, the pilgrims looked at it as an act of God that, that came through and allowed that village to be um, abandoned and wiped out due to uh, the plague that had ripped through from 1616 to 1619. Obviously, we, we don't look at that as, as an act of God, but more as a really dark point in the, the history of, of our people. There's estimates that you know 70 to 80 percent of the Wampanoag Nation died during 1616 and 1619. We had conflicts going on with our neighboring tribes as well who now were looking at us as vulnerable and could expand their territory so we had we had all of those things happening at that same point when the pilgrims arrived and i don't think that had those situations happened that in 1620 the pilgrims would have arrived on our shores and they would have been welcomed our ancestors needed support, they needed an ally. So we make that assumption that that is the backdrop to that moment between the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag, because at that point, the Pilgrims needed support. They were, they were sick, they were hungry, they were cold, they were not in Virginia where they intended to be. 
And the Wampanoags, in the same respect, were uh, depleted in our numbers and our resources, and we were being attacked by, by our neighbors. So you had two groups that needed each other at that particular moment in time and history. The minute that the uh, Europeans no longer needed that alliance, it quickly broke down. Once that need on the European side had, had broken down, and once their new need was to expand their, their land base for their cattle, for their, their farms, it required them to further encroach on the land of the Wampanoags. And that's where you really started to see some conflicts and ultimately the, the King Philip's War. wanted to, to get a feel for how open they were going to be to telling the story as accurately as we understand it. And what came out of that was agreeing that, that yes, this story should be told from the perspective of Native Americans without censorship. And that to us was a very telling moment in how this, this event was gonna unfold. It told us that, that everybody involved was committed to, to getting the history as accurate and correct as possible. We have to recognize that there are diverse groups and populations within our world that, that need to be protected. And, and certainly over the past couple of months now, we've, we've seen a heightened awareness in the world to, to the needs of some of our minority populations and how they're viewed. And so we look at the work that, that we're doing now to get the history correct. And while yes, this happened 400 years ago, we've constantly seen it as vitally important to understand why certain groups and populations continue to struggle today. And so, if we can tell our history accurately, I think then people can become a little bit more compassionate. 